The first thing I'd say is that um, I had done a study of this years ago at Williams, and there was just a new one at Duke. You know, what does it cost to educate, you know, a student, county room and board, you know, for a year? And they just did a paper, and it was eighty thousand dollars. So eighty thousand dollars a year. Now you look at that eighty thousand bucks, and you think, man, that's expensive. They must uh, overpay the faculty, and they must be incredibly inefficient and just throw away their money left and right. But I remind people that to incarcerate somebody for a year, you know, in Illinois, California, New York, is, is about sixty thousand a year. And uh, sometimes I joke we have better food and smaller classes, but. You know, whether it's a joke or not, you know, I mean, if it costs to keep somebody in jail for 60 years, you know, it's probably not that $60,000 $60, for one year. It's probably not all that surprising that, it, that Duke spends 80000 a year on an undergrad. So that's why it costs, you know, but it's a separate question because as you know from your investment club and study and I hope some economics, the decision on, you know, trying to make normal profit or abnormal profit is very much independent, depends on how competitive, of course, the product market is, but it's very different from, um, you know, what you can charge. I mean, there are a lot of places that, you know, wish they could have a profit, a better profit margin, and they have very high cost structure, and they wish they could, you know, why don't they just charge more, right? So there's a difference between the cost of supplying a year of higher education and what the price elasticity of the demand curve is. The sticker price, first of all, most people will be surprised when they learn, if you look at all of the millions of undergrads in, at private higher education, 14% of them pay the sticker price. 86% of them get a discount off the sticker price. At Northwestern, we have about 38% of our students. So we have a sticker price counting room and board of 62,000 a year. Um, a little bit more than one third of our students pay that. The average of everybody else is about 28,000 counting room and board. So the first thing is, when you talk about the price of college, and this is one thing I always try to remind people in DC, is that you're talking about the net price, and the net price, uh, especially at the highly selective privates like Northwestern, have been falling in real terms for now over 10 years, not rising. Not because we don't have the market, you know, we have an admit rate of 13%, Penn is at 8%, right? You know, they could, we could charge you whatever the hell we want, but we don't want to have sticker shock. We don't want students with financial aid getting scared away by the sticker shock. And we also, frankly, have a lot of political pressures in the White House and elsewhere about, you know, not increasing the price that much. But if you look historically for the last 40 years, what the best predictor is of the sticker price that our schools charge, you know what it is? It's the rate of growth in after-tax income for the few Americans who are rich enough to pay it, which now is about the top 5% of Americans which is about family income of 250000 and above. So it drives me a little crazy when presidents talk about why they increased, you know, 3.8 we did last year. That was the Kofi average. You know, and they say, well, it's, you know, study abroad is expensive and library, you know, that's, that's completely conflating what we charge and what the market would bear. You know, the reason why we increased 4% a year, you know, which is 2.5% oh, real, is because that was the growth in the after-tax income of the top 5% of Americans. Why is that relevant? They're the only ones paying it, right? So that's the typical market. Now we're for, but not for profit, but you know, we would be crazy to price more rapidly increase than the people who actually pay the sticker price, than their income, their ability to pay. Now, with political pressures, actually, the after-tax income for the top 5% of Americans went up more than 3.8 last year, and that's happened now three years in a row, and, which means that the richest people in this society, and there's been an incredible increase in income inequality in this country after 1979. All the progress from 1900 to 1979 was wiped out from 1979 to 2014. That's the distribution of income. Distribution of wealth, you have to go back to 1925 pre-Great Depression to find this degree of inequality, that's fueling, of course, the increase in the sticker price because the few people, who can, Americans who can afford to pay it, are getting so rich so fast. And you could ask the question, if you increase your sticker price more slowly than their income, then they have more money for you know, vacations, which is nice, for philanthropy, which is great. But you know, given that the rate of return, the monetary return to a higher education is now at a record level, you know, what's really the justification to give people an even more of a bargain? The other thing is, again, if we spend, like Duke, 80000 a year 
and you know your, your parents run hedge funds and they're incredibly rich, the most we charge is 62. So everybody gets an $18,000 subsidy. The rest of everybody else, as I said before, pays an average of about 27 or 28. So there's a general subsidy of 80 minus 62, and then for almost two thirds of our student, it's not, it, it's 80 minus 62 minus 28. So, you know, that's the subsidy that we provide. I'm sorry if that went along too long.